Okay, welcome to week nine. This is a lecture that is required that I teach you. It personally should be taught later in the programs, uh, my opinion. However, I will cover, at least parts of this should be, I should say. Um, it's, I'm covering three separate topics. The first topic is views. It's fairly straightforward and easy. Index is a little more complex and partitions is more of an info dump, just so you know. Okay, and it skipped the views. Or maybe views will show up later, anyways. I think I put it in the wrong order. If it doesn't show up in the slideshow for some unknown reason, that means my slideshow has been eaten by PowerPoint, and that's, I'll cover the material anyways. First things first, we'll talk about indexes then. Indexes are really important to speed up query processing time. Now, essentially, there's certain kind of queries that you run in a system on a regular basis. Whether you search using a phone number, an email address, or whatever. Your voice carries really well. Whatever topic you use to search on, the database server needs to look through it. And Years ago, somebody came up with a method to make things go a little faster, and they're called indexes. They're, it's an invisible structure in the sense that once it's been created, you don't see it again. It's still there. You can actually explore it using the database object browsers and stuff like that, but it's something you don't play with once it's created. And what happens is when you do a normal search and there's no index, it does what's called a sequential scan. And, of course, the database, the records go in in whatever order. That doesn't mean that A's are after B's after C's. They go in in whatever order. So let's say I want to find everybody in here whose name, last name, starts with A. So I'd go, you, what's your last name? You give me your last name. I go, oh, that doesn't start with A. I go to Amanda, what's your last name? It doesn't start with A. No, it doesn't start with A. I go to the next person. That's called the sequential scan. I have to go through record by record to identify each one for the match of criteria. If there's 10,000 rows, that won't take very long, believe it or not. If there's 10 million rows, 100 million rows, keep adding a zero, it's going to take a while. So they came up with something called index file storage organization. So essentially there's a variety of different systems. And the various systems do a few things. There's one that stores the records sequentially. That one's a little gross. Or they're stored non-sequentially. The sequential one is the old way of doing things, where it would read the file, start writing out the records, write the new one in the right spot. So it's a bit like when you look at an accountant in his filing cabinet, where he'll go, he'll start flicking through, and he'll insert a customer into the right spot in their filing cabinet. That's called sequential. But the non-sequential, you want to use an index. So that's basically it's anywhere in random order. But the index keeps track of where everything is. So you know when you open up a textbook and you look at the back of the book and there's an index at the back and you're looking up for certain topics and it tells you, oh, this is on page 5, this is on page 62. And you can look up for the keyword and you can jump to the right spot. An index in a database server does something similar. <coughs> Significantly more high tech, but it still works the same way. So an index is a database structure. It's not a table. It's not a field. It's not a function. It's a structure. It has its purpose in life is an index. It's, it's designed specifically for that. And then each index is built based on certain conditions when you create it. Now, for starters, primary keys are always indexed. When you define something as a primary key, the database server will always create an index for it. Why? Because most of the time when you pull up a record, you search by I primary key to retrieve it. Imagine if it was a, num a numeric one still pretty fast, but imagine if you had 10 million rows, I want to pull up record 97,532. And you had to do a sequential scan. You'd go, one is that 97,000 whatever. No. Two is this. No. And it would jump until it hit 97,000 rows in and change and then pull the one record you want. So it would have to do it 97,000 times asking if it's the right one. The, an index, which I'll explain in a bit how it works, will go 
we'll basically quickly jump through the list and jump to the right spot. And of course, numbers are the easiest to index. I'll be, as I said, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, you can actually create indexes with multiple fields. So you can index on, say, phone number and postal code. Or you can index on last name and phone number. So if you always search for people by their last name and the last four digits of their phone number, that index would use that. And these are called non-unique indexes because they're secondary indexes. The primary key index is a unique index because it must be unique. Now, there's a kind of index called a B tree. And historically, and I was wrong, I used to teach it this way too until I was actually told I was wrong. Uh, and I can blame my database prof 20 years ago because he taught it this way to me also. What we, he used to call it, we call, he called it a binary tree. No, it's not a binary tree, it's called best tree. The B stands for best, not for binary. And the way it works is it takes all the values of the database, and a B tree can only be four layers deep. So that means when you're looking up a value, it only needs to look up in four places before it gets a really good guess of where to get the record. What it does, it takes the total number of rows, divides it in half. And then it'll take that half and divide it in half again. And it'll take the next half and divide that in half again. So you'll end up with half, quarters, eighths of the database split across the bottom. And I'm, I'm being a simpl I'm simplifying here. It's not really divided in half. It's divided in best number of columns. But for demonstration purposes, it's easier to explain it in halves for now. As you can see on the diagram here, the data is broken in two, then it's each of those is broken in two, and then each of those is broken in two. Realistically, what it does is it calculates the best number of breakdowns. So if you have 10 million rows, it's not going to be 5 million and 5 million. It'll do maybe 10. So, you know, one block of 1 million, then it'll take that million. Maybe it'll break that down in blocks of 10, and then it'll take that and break it down in twos. Um, it'll fan out to hundreds wi wide but it can only ever go four deep. Uh, they, there has been uh, a couple of new index trees now that allow deeper than four because the data sets are getting so huge that now it's actually slowing down, being able to go across, navigate, you know, branching through the whole thing. But B trees are still used everywhere. Now, the syntax is as follows. Create index, the name of the index, on the table and the column as applied. So similar to how you create a table, you go create table customers. You define it. With an index, you go create index, you give it a name. It doesn't care, call it whatever you want. Personally, I like prefixing them with IDX, but that's just me. So in this case, in my case, it would be create index IDX name or IDX person name. And you go on. So you'd say, okay, this index belongs to this. And then the, the next thing you define is, um, let me just grab the little marker here. That's the name. That's the table. Whew, that's a great name. And that's the column. So the name of the index on, then you say what table, and then inside the brackets, the columns that belong to the index. Now, here's a little bit more of an explanation. If I create an index, and this one is called double index because it's indexing two different columns at the same time. So create double index on person, age, and city. So if I were to create a query that says select star from person where age is equal to 55 and city is equal to Seattle, that index will help with that particular query. However, it will not help if you just go where city is equal to Seattle. Because it, it, that city does not have a single index to itself. So what happens, there's something called a query optimizer. What it does, it looks at your query, looks at the structure of the table, looks at the available indexes. And if it finds an index that matches your where clause, it'll use that index. And then it'll optimize it. So instead of, you know, 
having to sequentially scan everything for the ages, numbers are great. Because they'll say, let's say the range of ages is 97. Say the ages go 3 to 97. So what it would do is it would create the first branch, and you might have a range of 3 to 20, 21 to 45, say 45 to 97. And it's not always exactly broken down based on the numbers. It, looks, it, it takes the number of records in each and breaks it down. Then it would take this one and break it down maybe to 3 to 12, and then 13 to 20. And then on the fourth layer, it would go 3 to 6, and then 7 to 12, like this. So what would happen is it says, well, if the person's age is 12 or is 11, it'll go, oh, it's, does it fall inside this range? Yes. Does it fall into this range or this range? Oh, it falls under this range. Then it says, which range does it fall into here? So then it only needs to search for the records 7 to 12 instead of 3 to 97. So that's what the B tree does. And it does the same thing with letters. So it'll do all the, the alphabetical. It'll do A, A1, A2, you know, blah, 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 until you get to A, Z. And then it'll do B, C, D, E, F. It'll sort the index is broken down in that manner. Yes? Does make a difference because you're including two columns, it would use that index. If you only include the one column, it tries to find the best matching index that matches all the columns in your where clause. If it happens that you got two sets of columns in your where clause that belong in two separate indexes, it'll try to figure out the best index of the two to use to speed things up. And then, you know, sometimes it'll actually manage to use both depending on the combination of the columns. It's not a guarantee though. Well, what it would do, if, first of all, if you don't have an index, it would sequentially scan A, B, C, D. Well, even in this situation, if there's no index, it would go A, B, C, D until it hits S. And then it would look for, you know, S, A, S, B, S, C until it finds literally the whole word Seattle. So it will sort it in memory and then start walking through it one by one. If you've got 10 million rows, it's going to take a while. Well, the B, what you do is you create another index just for city which I'm going to explain in a minute before I change off the index to this topic. Um, some of the bad things about indexes. Um, now, it works with range queries also if you actually have like an age. If you include a range, it'll actually speed up a range search, obviously, because it knows what the ranges look like. Now, the question at the bottom is, why not create indexes on everything? Yes, they do. And there's a couple of issues with indexes. The first thing is, let's say your table occupies 100K. So it's not a lot of data, 100K. And your primary key index is 2K. Great. So if I'm actually going to write these numbers down on the board as I go. And mind you, a lot of this stuff is just pure conjecture. Like I'm, uh, These numbers are not realistic. But let's say I've got the table is 100K. The primary key index is 2K. It's actually pretty small. Actually, probably closer to like 50K. But we're going to go with 2K. Now let's say in this here we have where we have a name column where we're indexing people's names. And we have up to 50 characters in a person's name. The name index could occupy 50k. Theoretically it's possible. Uh, let's say we have a phone number index. This one could occupy 40k. And let's say there's another one for email. 
And the email one's occupying 50K because emails can be pretty big. And now we have a joint one where we've got name plus phone. It may occupy 85K because there's maybe some compression happening here. So if I suddenly start adding all this up, 10, 18, The indexes are occupying 227K. The table is only 100K. The indexes are actually taking up more room, the actual data. That's, that's issue number one. Uh, probably, I don't know if my math is right, but that's close enough. Yeah, the index is permanent. Yes, you can drop it, then it releases the disk space. So you can, but creating indexes take time. It's not instant. It actually has to crawl through every record, figure out the best way to arrange the index, and then write it. Okay, so that issue number one is the amount of space it occupies. Issue number two is I.O. performance. Now, do you guys know what I.O. performance is? How much time does it spend talking to the hard drive or to the memory or to the virtual disk? Just how much time does it spend communicating with the storage on the system? Now, if you insert a record into this table, the insert, so let's say we insert into this table, we have, we write once, right? So this is the number of writes. In actual fact, it's easy to count. Actually, I don't even need to start writing on the board. We insert into this table. Operation number one is the insert. Two, three, four, five, six. So for the number of times it needs to access the disk, is one time for this, two times for every index. It has two. This one has a write operation, and each of these have a read-write operation. Because it's got to read the index, figure out the best spot to put the entry, and then write the index down to the disk. But this means that for one, two, three, four, five indexes, you're doing 10 operations to the disk plus the initial write. So that means you're, you're talking to the hard drive 11 times, at least. Doesn't sound like much. Let's say you're doing a, a thousand inserts a, a second. So 1,000 a second times 10 operations is 10,000 disk operations. Our hard drives are fast. I can guarantee once you start hitting 10,000 IOPS a second, you're going to start noting performance de degradation. That's only for inserting records. Now if somebody's trying to read records, somebody's trying to update records or delete records, same thing. You do a delete, it has to go through every index and remove the entry. For every update, it has to go through these and find which columns were modified and update the matching pieces of the index. Each index requires extra communication. So every single time you touch a record, it has to talk to every index one by one. So it's almost as if I was in this room and I had to explain to each and every one of you individually. You know, I decide today I'm not Dan, I'll be Dave. But the way it would work is pretend I had to go to each and one of you individually and say, my name is Dave, my name is Dave, my name is Dave. But first thing first is you'd have to go more like, Amanda, what's my name? No, originally. Okay, no, Amanda, my name is now Dave. Do you have that? What's my name now? No, it's Dave now. <laughs> Hot damn, I love working with Amanda. I love working with Amanda. I told you I'm your nightmare. No, but actually you made a point. What happens if there's something goes wrong with the disk in the process? That's kind of come. I'd have to ask you again. So as you notice, I said, what's my name? Dan. Okay, I got this. So now update it to be Dave. Now let's make sure it actually happened. What's my name? Dave. That took how many interactions to make that happen? Now imagine if I had to do it. A thousand times a second, right? So indexes are great. Don't overdo it because you're just adding overload. You're, add, you're, you're going to add up extra disk space. And I'm using small numbers here. I mean, at work, one of my tables at work is two and a half gigs, just one table. I have one index on that table, <laughs> just saying. Just the primary key index. If I need to search that, I am totally willing to live with the sequential scans because some of the columns are huge. Um, but yeah, if you have a really big table, say 
even you know a 50 megabyte table, each of these indexes could be 10 megs, 25 megs, 30 megs each. So suddenly you'd go from a 100 meg table to occupying 500 megs for one table. And all this is just metadata that lets you find the stuff faster. That's okay, but you know, server space costs money. Hard drives are not cheap. They're cheap for our laptops. Server grade hard drives are not cheap. Amazon will charge you through the nose for database, that much database space. So we try to minimize the number of indexes as possible. That's consequence number one and two. Space and the number of time you spend writing, reading and writing from the disk. There's one more bad thing to indexes. Confusion. Not confusion from a user. The query optimizer will get confused. Most servers have gotten really good. They don't tend to panic as much as they used to. However, query optimizers actually do have a limit. And what would happen is, let's say I'm searching for a person. And I've got an index that's also email and phone. But I don't have all those different combinations. Uh, maybe I don't have name, email, and phone. So then I do a search for a person, and I'm searching for their name, a piece of their name, because I don't know the exact spelling of their last name. I don't have their full email address because I couldn't understand, I couldn't read their handwriting. And normally you only search for part of a phone number. So now I'm searching on three fields. However, I've only got indexes that cover two. The query optimizer will look at this and go, which one do I use? Am I going to use this index? Am I going to use this index? I'm going to use one of these. He'll go, I can't decide. To hell with this, sequential scans for everyone. If you have too many indexes, the query optimizer cannot guess which one to use. It'll abandon it and move on and don't even bother use it. So at this point, you've created all these fantastic indexes, and the server doesn't know what to do with them anymore, and it dies. Um, as the, op the optimizer dies and it says, we will not optimize this query, we are going to run it as is. We won't even try to find the fastest way to get the answer. It's taking me too long to make a guess. Therefore, this is now killing performance. We're just going to go with it. And then it grinds forever. Why? Because you made it too complicated. Um, there's a reason why, for those of us that are old enough, remember the card files in high school and grade school when you went to the library and you had to find a book and you pulled out the drawer with all the cards. And normally they were organized in one of three ways, by title, by author, and by subject. And that was it. Therefore, if you needed to find certain books on certain subjects, you'd look up the cards for that subject and have a list of books that matched. Or if you knew what the authors were, you could find the authors and go look for all the books for that author. Limited number of indexes. And the, it's the same issue with the database server. If you give it too many indexes, it gets confusing. Keep it simple. Imagine if we went to school and we could search by 10 different methods. We'd never know how to find a book in those little card file systems. Do we look at it by name? Do we look at it by author? Do we look by, you know, insert thing here? Uh, imagine if we had, you know, keyword files or drawers that we could search for specific words inside the book. That'd be terrible. You never would have found it. So that's the three things why you don't create an index. Unless you have, you should create indexes, just don't overdo it. It's like too much of a good thing. Everybody loves ice cream. You shouldn't sit there with the five-gallon tub and a spoon. Because you'll be the size of the five-gallon tub by the time you're done. Yes. Oh, no, that, there's not a limit of number of columns. It's just the data set I've given you guys. Them, I mean, there still could be tables of 20, 30 columns. It just depends on the data you're working with. It's the normalization isn't about getting it down to like five columns per table. It's about breaking a table down to the minimum number of columns that represent something. And if you're talking about a person and you also keep having to keep track of their geographic location, their age, their sex, their hair color, all that, I mean, those are all columns, right? It's entirely possible to have many columns on a record. That has nothing to do with normalization. Uh, 
Oh, but uh, th then the index would only work if you searched against all five columns at the same time. No, but you'd, no, it wouldn't. Because if you said, oh, uh, give me everything where the name is Dan, because that's one of the columns, name. Search for Dan, and you have an index with five columns, it'll ignore that index, because you're only asking for one column. So it, it uses only what's in the where. So if you have two columns in the where, it'll look for an index that has two columns. If you have an index with five columns, and you don't supp supply all five columns as part of your where clause, it'll ignore the index. So when you search for a primary key, you search for usually one or two columns, one column, hopefully. It'll search an index for one column, and it'll search for the primary key's index. So number of columns, it, that's how the optimizer chooses it. It goes, oh, you're searching on age, like it right over here, right? Searching on age and city. That means it'll find an index. It'll look for the index that has both age and city inside of it. If it doesn't find that index, it won't use it. If it doesn't find that exact index, it won't use it. All right, so that's indexes. That's the long and short of the index. Essentially, create an index on important columns. Don't overdo it. You're sometimes better off having a bunch of single column indexes as opposed to having multi-column indexes. Unless it's a search you do on a regular basis, don't use multi-column. Because most people search for one column at a time. Yes? It'll it'll try to if one of the two columns is in a single column index, it'll use that one. If there's two indexes, one for each column, it'll try to guess which which index will give it the best benefit. So it'll only use one at a time. It'll never D depending on the server. Some servers can use more than one index. Postgres is able to use more than one index at once. It'll use index number one to reduce the set, it'll use index number two to reduce the set further. And then it'll merge the results. But not all servers are able to do that. The disadvantages? Space, I.O., and optimizer confusion. No problem. All right. Next topic is hashed filed organization. This is the old way of doing indexes, more or less. And what happens is it uses a hashing algorithm. If you guys don't know what a hash is, it's a fingerprint of the data. So you take the data, you minimize it down to a very small piece of information. So it's almost like a checksum. Um, now going way back, there used to be a checksum system called a CRC32 and a CRC8. And essentially what it'd do is it'd, you'd give it a value and it would give you a, a, a number. And this number would be the fingerprint for that data. Um, some more modern implication, uh, applications are MD5, SHA1. These are modern hashing algorithms. MD5 is dead as a doorknob. You should never use it for anything except for make sure your files are valid. But the other ones are still in use. Um, so this hashing algorithm, and what it does is it determine it basically groups the records in lists, a bit like the B tree, but instead of a B tree, it actually builds lists of records. And as you add records, it actually adds the names to the right lists. So let's see if I got a better slide that explains it. No, of course not. <laughs> um, Essentially, what happens is it figures out the position inside of a hashed file organization based on math. Instead of a B tree where it actually has an actual location, it'll actually find where the closest matching record is, divide the rest of the results, and then it'll, it'll keep dividing in half. So you know, did you ever play the game, guess the number? Did you know most people technically should be able to win within six guesses? Okay, well, example, give me a guess number between 1 and 50. 1 and 50. I got a number in my head between 1 and 50. Where would you start? Why would you start there? 25. And then, I, and then that's your first guess, right? 
And then the problem is, then I gotta, I, I'll answer to you whether it's higher or lower than 25. I'll go higher. So where do you go next? 42 between 25 and 50. And I'll go lower. Then you go sort of the halfway. And then no, lower. And then you do the difference one more time. And then you've you're, you got one of 50 50 chance of getting it right. And that's what the division remainder does. Basically, you take it, divides it in half, looks at what's there, divides it in half, looks at what's there, divides it in half, looks at what's there until it finds it. These are essentially, they, they're set up in lists in memory. And the problem with the hashing algorithm is it'll sort the hash in order. So let's say our hash is set up as A11A, and the next one is A11B, A11C. So it's all, so let's say our hash is broken down. It's able to figure out every record using four characters. So figure that, that one there. So what it will do is it'll go look up in from the slide here. It'll look up the word flyers. And it'll go, oh, flyers. There's a hash mark. There's a hash for flyers. And that could be B35F. And what it'll do is it'll go look at the first character of this, look inside the hash, go, is B less than or greater than the middle of my list? It'll go, oh, it's less than the middle. It'll take that, divide it again. Then it'll finally hit the Bs. Then it'll take the next digit and go, okay, well, now inside the Bs, what's my range inside of that? Divide, 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 divide. It sounds less efficient than a normal index, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's better. It just depends on the data. Postgres supports hashed uh, indexes. I've never s used them. <laughs> Just saying. My, I've always used B trees and H trees. Uh, I don't even cover H trees. That's a heuristic tree where the, it tries to be intelligent on breaking down the data. Um, H trees are very complex. 99% uh, of the time, a B tree will do the job for you. Hashed file. These were really, really popular back when people used to use uh, meaningful identifiers. So if all you had was SID numbers, it would actually do the, the hashes for that were tiny. You take all those digits, you add them up, and it gives you a number, and there's your hash. Then away you go, and then you just start dividing up the, the base. So that's the hashes. All right, there's a couple different kinds of indexes. There's unique and non-unique. Usually, unique is for primary keys. You want your primary keys to be unique. So you can actually create an index that says, no duplicate values allowed inside me. I'm a special snowflake. There is no one else like me. And that means no, no values inside of me can be the same twice. But you can actually use it on other columns. Let's say you want to always make sure that an email address is unique. You can actually create a unique index on an email address, and you'll never be allowed to insert a duplicate email address. You'll generate an error message instead. Then there's what they call secondary indexes, the non-unique. This is for columns, or use them on columns that are fields that are used to either do aggregates, grouping, or common searches. If you're always searching by zip code, by all means, index the zip code. If you're always searching by phone number, knock yourself out. Index the phone numbers. You'll just make things a little faster. Yes? Yes. When you create a primary key, modern database servers automatically create a unique index for it. You can choose to create another unique index if you wanted to. Uh, you could create a unique index on an email address. You'd use the syntax, you know, create unique index, blah, 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 on customer email. It's your choice. But usually, modern servers create the unique indexes automatically. Um, back when I was learning SQL, when I was learning, you know, this kind of stuff, we were using Oracle, and Oracle did not create the unique primary keys. You'd create the table, then you had to create your unique index. It's just how it was. 
it's not like that anymore because somebody thought, holy crap, what a stupid idea to make the people have to remember to do that every time. Let's make it automatic because the more things that are automated, the less mistakes are going to happen. So that's the pri pri unique and non-unique. Okay, a few basic rules. You want to use them on larger tables. Index the primary key of each table. This happens automatically, but you know, goes without saying, it should be done. Index search fields that you find often in the where clause. Phone numbers, names, email addresses, that kind of stuff. Fields that you often find in order by and group by. Those are other columns you may want to index. Why? It'll create the bins faster. Um, but like I said, you don't want to overdo it either because you're going to cause other kinds of grief. Uh, when there are more than 100 values, but not when there's less than 30 values. Now, that seems stupid because there seems to be 100, uh, 70 values missing. Essentially, what they're saying is if there's more than 100 values, it's probably worth creating an index. If there's less than 100 values, especially if there's less than 30, don't create an index. Honestly, anything under, nowadays, this is an older slide actually from years ago that I had this slide I inherited from someone else. And it used to be uh, if you had 100 records, it made a big difference. Nowadays, I could say the same thing if there's more than 1,000 records, even more than 10,000 records, then you probably want to create an index. So that's basically it. So you create the indexes you know, if there's a lot of records. But if there's less than 30, don't bother. All right. Avoid the use of indexes for fields with long values. Maybe you want to compress these values first. This sounds kind of strange when I say that. But if you're talking about fields that have really long values, such as um, a biography, a personal bio. You know how some websites will let you put in a little biography of yourself? Don't index that crap. Like, honestly, that's just big. You're wasting space. Nobody's going to search on that anyways. If you really need to index that stuff, you probably just want to create a hash of some sort or you know, you want to create what they call a compressed version of the field. Get rid of ands, ors, nots, its. Just find words that aren't common English words that you find in every single sentence. Um, if the key to index is to determine the location of a record. Now this sounds kind of weird, as in where is it in the actual table? They use a surrogate, such as a number. It allows the spread to be more even. So for example, if we were to index Middle Eastern names, there'd be an awful lot of Mohammeds in the middle. Just saying. So you end up with an uneven spread. If you were using, say, the person's name as the primary key, which of course we shouldn't, but if we were using the person's name, there'd be an uneven spread of values because, well, you know, Mohammed's a pretty common name in the Middle East. At least so I've been told. Right? There's a lot of those in the middle. So that means that there'd be less spread across on each side. On the other hand, if you gave each Mohammed a number, one, two, three, four, five, it's easier to spread the numbers out evenly. The numbers will be, it's mathematically easy to divide. Whereas with, if you're using you know, certain other things, it's hard to divide. So if you're going to be using it for an index, try to use numbers. In other words, try to use you know, numeric integers for your primary keys. They're easier to index. They're easier to spread out. It makes the searches faster. Um, some database servers have a limit of indexes or the number of bytes per indexed field. Most modern servers know. There is a common sense limit, but there's no real physical limits. But if you're stuck working with an older server, an older Ingress server, an old DB2 server, they actually have limits. You, some of them only allow you to have 10 indexes. Or some of them only allow you to index a, a field that has less than 50 bytes. You may have to, in, to explore your limits. You'll know when you hit a wall, it'll tell you you're not allowed to do this. Um, now, careful to not index fields that allow nulls. 
There's a reason for that. Null values are ignored in the index. So for example, phone number. Here's the best example. Phone number. We allow nulls in phone number. We index phone number. And we go select star from customers where phone like 555 and name something else. And it will actually ignore the nulls. Like it, so if you said where phone is equal to 555 or name is equal to Dan, even if you have Dan's with null phone numbers, those won't be found. Because it's using an index on email, but it ignores any records that have a null. So the index now starts lying to you. So if I have null values in my index, it returns a false set of records. So if we have, say, 500 records, half of them are null, and we search on that field that allows nulls, it only say you only have 250 records in this index. We're going to use this index, but there's only 250 records because it ignores the nulls. So this leads you to the rule is you shouldn't index a field that allows nulls. Pretty straightforward. Index mandatory fields. Don't index fields that allow nulls unless you have a good reason to do it. You're just going to cause the database server to lie. Got a question? Yeah. Um, depending on the server, it'll probably generate an error. So if you, you try to index too much, it'll bomb out. If you index one too many, create one too many index, it'll say maximum limit achieved or error code 145672. Go look that up in a book or Google that. Um, there's no real way of knowing what the message is going to be. It depends on the server. Um, normally what you want to do is you want to start perusing the documentation and see if there's what the limits are. And then, you know, when there's actual physical limits on the number you're allowed to have, it's actually a good thing. Because it forces you to be really um, thrifty, like a Scotsman, with your indexes. You don't want to get too creative because it says you're, you're overdoing it. All right. So that's the rules for using indexes. Um, that's basically, the basic rules are fairly straightforward. Don't index big things, limit number of indexes, don't index nulls. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. That one's not even on slide, I don't list on the topics of the day, but denormalization. Denormalization is after you've normalized your database and it's been in use for a little while, and there's lots of records inside of it, and then your manager says, Can you give me a report on insert criteria here. And you write yourself for yourself a spiffy little SQL statement and then you hit run. And then 30 seconds pa passes. 5 minutes passes. 20 minutes passes and it's still going. Because the database structure is so complex and there's so much data now in the database server that the queries are taking forever to run. Servers only have so much memory. What happens What happens on your computers when you run out of memory? No. It just slows down. Do you know why it's slowing down? Sure. Swapping to disk, which I think is what you're about to say also. Computers have what's called swap space. There's a space uh, on your hard drive that's allocated as RAM. When you run out of RAM, it starts writing, taking out pieces of your memory and writing them to the disk. You know your hard drive is a lot slower than your RAM, right? No matter how fast your hard drive is, it's never going to be as fast as your RAM. Not yet anyways. It's getting there, but not yet. So it'll swap out to the disk over and over and over again. So if the query gets really, really big, it'll swap out to the disk. So what happens is... People have come up with the idea, and it's not a, like a revolutionary idea. It's just somebody came around and said, shoot, I'll do this instead. It's called denormalization. You're going to take the database structure that you proudly normalized, and then you're going to find the way to denormalize it as much as you can. So what that means is you are going to create with, uh, pivot tables or basically spreadsheets. 
you'll take the complex queries that you run that take forever to run, and you're going to populate these other tables. You create new tables. You don't break the ones you have. You create new tables. So let's say the way we have it organized now, we have uh, customers, countries, provinces, orders. We may create a record, create a table that has the customer's name, the name of the country, not the ID, the name of the province, and an order number and an order date inside of it. And maybe an order total, not what was in the order. So if we had a structure that looks like this, if I went Hey. Ah, oh, frig. Oh, of course, I can't even kill it. That's annoying. Anyways, whatever. You can read my daughter's messages. Yep. <laughs> Great. Ah, uh, countries, states. Orders. Order lines. So this is a structure you guys should recognize because you know that's basically assignment one. Not assignment one, that was uh, some of the, the labs. So you have this structure. Realistically, we may end up with a structure when we're done with this that looks like this. We could have the customer name. The country name. State name. Order ID, order total. And what's in here is just the summarization of all the other data. So for every time we write a record into this, we'd also write a single record into there that summarizes the customer's name, what country, their state, maybe their city, whatever. Uh, the order they placed, maybe the order total. That way we can actually run a summary every day of what the total sales were. But instead of having to crawl through say, 10,000 rows of this, let's say there was, I don't know, 5,000 orders placed on average, there was three lines per order. So that's 15,000 rows in order lines on average. But this one here is 5,000. There would be 5,000 rows in here instead of 15,000. 5,000 is a lot less to work with than 15,000. And for a lot of companies, you know, this isn't all that important. But when you start hitting big data, like amazon size data, or, you know, aliexpress size data, the data gets huge. The amount of stuff that they keep is insane. They have to do this daily. Otherwise, they can't run reports. It's impossible. Amazon could not ever run a report at 1 AM to ask for the day's total sales by region. They couldn't do it. So they have a job that runs every night populating stuff that looks like this. This is called denormalized data. Now, it improves performance for reporting. There's no joins. It's a flat table. It's instant. You can even index this stuff if you want. But there's always, with everything else in the world, good things have bad things. It takes up room. It's possible for the data to get damaged. Remember the whole update anomaly, insert anomaly, deletion anomaly? This is susceptible to that. What happens if the customer that's here changes their name, now all their old records no longer match? That means on a part of the nightly batch job is I have to go find every single entry with that person's name and update every single row, one after another, because it's denormalized. There's risk to the data. Which is why often this is one way. The data comes into here and it's never changed again. This is summarization. 
That's what goes in here. Um, common targets for denormalization. One-to-one -one relationships. Remember I said don't do those? You shouldn't have to denormalize them if you don't do it in the first place. But it happens. Um, if you have associative entities, so for example, you have a setup where you have the order lines and then you have the products. Order lines is an associative entity between orders and products, right? This allows you to determine what products are in every order. It's an associative entity. When you denormalize for reporting purposes, you would get rid of this and in store, instead of that you'd have in the order lines, you'd store the, the product name and the price and all that denormalized for reporting purposes. You wouldn't store it in your main active data store. You'd do it in the long-term storage. So on a nightly basis, you'd summarize the daily reports and insert them into the long-term storage. So at the end of every day, there's a, what they call a batch job. And did you guys ever hear of the frame batch job? Anybody who ever worked retail probably remembers. You know, at the end of the day, you close your cash. And then you hit a button and often they'd say batch. And what it does, it actually takes a daily sales, summarizes it into a digest, and then it sends it to corporate. And corporate takes your daily sales digest, which is denormalized daily sales, and they put it in their, their system. That's basically what, it, what it's for. That's, that's another target you want to denormalize. Uh, reference data, reference tables, countries, states. When you do this, get rid of, the, get rid of that when you go to denormalize. Why create extra joins if you don't need to? It's not like countries change name every week. Unless you're Yugoslavia. Then it was every three months for a while. You know, the joy. Okay, now, when you denormalize, there's some risks. You can increase chance of errors and inconsistencies. You can reintroduce anomalies, as I just said. If the business rules change, you may end up having to reprogram. Somebody may have to change the queries that populate this. Somebody may need to change the reports so they reflect the new structures. It's not just, oh, we're going to add this extra column to this, and now you know, the numbers are weird because the, nobody took the time to update the rest that goes with it. Um, there's other ways to improve this. You could use it. There's other ways of avoiding denormalization, which is one is proper query design. Optimize. In other words, don't join every table to every other table. I've seen people do that. I don't know why. But they'll run a query and it joins absolutely every single table in the database to each other. So then they go, why does it take so long to run? I'm just trying to get a person's email address. And then why are you querying the product catalog? I don't know. Don't do that. Now, there's organizations that tables inside of the database. And what's really cool is most modern servers allow you to organize where the different tables are stored. If some modern servers will have MVME drives, so you know those little bubbles, those gum stick drives that are really, really fast, that run really, really hot, Samsung Evo 960, for example, really fast drive. They're not that big and they're really expensive. Not anymore, but they're compared to you know server drives, they are expensive. If you've got um, one of those, then you've got an SSD, then you've got a series of spin disks for stuff that doesn't get looked up very often. You can, with Postgres and Oracle, and I'm assuming Microsoft SQL Server, you create something called table spaces. And you can say table space fast, table space medium, table space slow. And stuff that gets looked up very often goes into the fast table space. And when you create the table, some of you have probably noticed that if you're browsing through a PG admin, there's a few spots you'll see the word table space. And you don't, know, I haven't taught you guys those SQL commands, but when you create a table, you can say create this table inside this table space. So for example, imagine if I, we were in a school like this, we have three classrooms. Classroom A is really, really fast, as in the teacher is talking faster than me. In classroom B, the teacher talks at a normal speed. In classroom C, the teacher talks to everybody like they're an idiot. Do you understand what I'm saying? And as I create students, I can allocate them 
to each room depending on their needs. For students that can understand people that talk fast, room A. For people that want to talk to a slow, a medium-paced room, room B. Whoever feels they need to be in room C, feel free to go there. But you can actually do that with the server by organizing the files on the disks. It's low-level optimization. It's not something you do right off the bat. It's once you start noticing that there's performance issues. And if you're using a hosted solution like Amazon, you don't have to worry about it. They take care of it for you. But if you're managing your own server and you have multiple disks inside the server, you may want to break down across multiple disks. And even if you have two fast disks, you may want to split the database on both disks. Because it's like anything else, right? In this room, imagine we only had one door. Everybody's got to come in and out the same door at the same time. It's going to take a little while to get rid of 100 people, right? Now we have two doors. How fast are we going to get rid of the people? Twice as fast. We put in three doors. You know, not as much of an improvement as getting two doors, but it's still a big improvement. Get four doors. It won't be four times as fast. It'll be, you know, divided by two, divided by two, your returns on your gains. But the, there is a limit of how much performance you're going to get out of this. But when you run a query, it needs to read from each of the table files. And as it reaches across each of the disks, if it can read from disk A and disk B at the same time, it's going to get the data twice as fast. As opposed to having to say, oh, give me all the customers. OK, now give me all the states. OK, now give me all the orders. You can only get one of them at a time, which is how it would on one disk. But if it was on two disks, it'd say, OK, you give me the customers and the states. You give me the orders, and I'll assemble them in memory. So I'll get the data from two places faster. So if you can't denormalize, for whatever reason, proper file structure will help. That's really advanced topics. That's like you know level four topics. But apparently, I'm supposed to talk about it. OK, the last set of topics. I think it's almost out of slides, too, I bet you. And I bet you it's not even going to talk about Great. PowerPoint's not cooperating. OK, partitioning. Partitioning is the distribution of rows into logical chunks. And there's two kinds. There's horizontal and, and vertical. Like I said, this is all info dumps. Now, horizontal partitioning means you are going to separate the data th this way. I know it sounds like I'm going vertical right now, but we're talking horizontal across the rows. Okay, that's horizontal partitioning, as in you're taking each set of rows and you're breaking them into different chunks. So, for example, if you take all these students on this side, you're one partition. All you guys over here are a different partition, and you guys are the third partition. And I need to search for people, you know, let's say I give you guys, you guys are all class A, class B, class C. And I just want to find all the class A students. I don't need to look at everybody, I can just look over here. That's a horizontal partition because I broke them down by hashes or by keys. Primary keys, for example, student numbers. Everybody whose student number is 40043 uh, four goes over here. 40044 four goes over here. And that way, I can say, just give me all the students that are 40043, and it's already broken down into that chunk, so I don't even need to talk to the rest of you. I can just talk to them. That's horizontal partitioning. So I take the records and separate them individually. Vertical partitioning is breaking it down by columns instead. So I could say, I'm going to take, and you end up with one-to-one -one relationships when you do this, just so you know. So you could put in a person's name, address, phone number on the fast disk, put in their color preference on the slow disk. So you create two tables with a one-to-one -one relationship, but you have the table sitting in two different places. So you, instead of taking this big table and writing it all in one go, you're breaking it down in smaller chunks, and it goes down. So you're breaking it sideways. So you take the columns, break them down in smaller pieces, and write them into the specific places. The biggest problem with that is you have to repeat the primary key in each table. So the primary key is actually being reused in multiple places. So you can no longer have an auto-incrementing primary key because they might get out of sync. 
from one table to the other. You can no longer have autom incrementing primary keys. It's also useful if you want to say certain users aren't allowed to see certain things. Ray is not allowed to look at credit card information. He's kind of sketchy looking. <laughs> Just saying. You know? Just saying, you know, I could actually separate the credit card information and put it on a separate area, and Ray's not allowed to look at that. But, you know, Claude could look at it. Whatever reason. Just saying. That's the, another purpose of vertical partitioning, but usually it's for performance. You'll put the uh, re re regularly search stuff on the fast disk and everything else on the slow disk. But you end up having to join the tables. So you're adding extra joins. It's not always a gift. Okay. Pros and cons, this isn't on an exam. They're there. Read the slides on your own. I'm just trying to get through this now. Um, that's vertical. That explain, I just finished explaining that. Oh, thank God. I thought I didn't have the slides for views. I guess I, when I rebuilt my slideshows, I moved it to the end. Okay. Views is this very simple, simple concept. We're done with the stupid crap. This is something you actually need to know. For This is something you actually need to know. Okay. The theory info dump is done. This is something useful to know. A view is a special kind of relation. So we know we talked about tables. That's a relation. Views are a special kind of relation, except they're not physically, well, they're usually not physically stored. It is a virtual view of the database. The syntax is fairly straightforward. It's create view, give it a name, whatever you want to call it, as, then you feed it an SQL statement. So what you're going to do first is you're going to write an SQL statement, make sure it's doing what you want it to do. You know, select name, project, firm, employees, where departments equal to development, in this case. So it'll give you the name of everybody and what they're working on if they work in development. And then once you're happy with your query, you create a view called developers. Now what this is going to look like, as far as the database is concerned, if you, then you could go select star from developers. It looks just like a table. But it's a table that has a, di a dynamic view behind it. The structure that the view is set, but the contents is updated live as the database changes. So if you insert a new employee, it shows up in the view. It's a dynamic view. It's not a comp, it basically, but it allows, it allows you to abstract the contents of the database. So for example, See how I've got the customer, the country, and the state, and then the orders? For this, I could create a view that does this. So I could go select star from order summaries. And I could actually create a view, that pretend I haven't denormalized it yet, that would return this exact set of data. But instead of having to do all the joins, you go select star from order summary. But inside of order summary, you could have you know, three or four joins and a couple of where clauses. All kinds of stuff. Um, this is a slightly more complex view. Essentially, it's selected from person is joining purchases. Um, it's a really horrible looking slide and a horrible looking query. Uh, but it's a I've been using it for years. I just haven't taken the time to actually rewrite it to make it pretty. But essentially, you've got a person table, which is a name in a city, a purchase which is a buyer, seller, product, and store, and then the product name and the maker. And this allows me to search. If I want to go, anybody who bought stuff in Seattle, I could create this view. So Seattle per view. And then I could literally search from Seattle view. It creates a virtual table. It's not a real table. It doesn't exist. The definition for it exists. And it's updated live all the time. Um, it's Like I said, it's for abstracting complex queries. Yeah. Yeah, you, literally it's, it's like a normal table. So if you do a select star from per, from customers, it'd be the same as select star from Seattle customers. It would look exactly the same, well, it would look similar. <coughs> yeah. You can. It's a virtual table. So in theory, with the previous uh, view behaves just like a table. Yes. So I mean, 
It, it does two things. When you create the view, it does the query optimization once. That means that every time you, you do the same thing, you ask for the same thing, it doesn't have to do the optimization a second time. So it skips a few steps. It stores the optimization. It knows exactly how to get the data out without having to guess again. So it saves a little bit there, not, not a huge amount, but it, you know, a few microseconds. But a few microseconds a million times is still a few seconds, right? Yeah, but it, it, sometimes you just want to create a view to abstract the data so people don't actually know what's there. Especially when you start working in more complex environments or security conscious environments. For example, when I was talking about the partitioning, the vertical partitioning, right, where based on your roles, you're allowed to see certain pieces of information or you're not. I could create a view that says limited view and Ray is only allowed to select from limited view. Claude can go select from full view. And the view hides the fact of what all the joins are. It abstracts. They don't need to know what the structure of the database is. They just need to know the name of the view. And it does the work for them. You can create, with the views, you can, tr you can do joins on them. You can put where clauses on them. So you go select star from employees or Seattle employees where name like Dan. And it'll give you everybody who works in Seattle has a name that starts with Dan. It, it behaves just like a table. No. No, but the view will use an index. It's the other way around. The view uses the physical attributes that are there, not the other way around. You cannot index the view, but the view can use the indexes. It's virtual. The indexes are not virtual. They're real. Um, The, the definition is stored, but not the view itself. The data is not stored. The view is a struct, is basically a window that says, this is the query I want to run, and it stores that definition for future. It's like a bookmark. God, my teacher in grade, my, my database teacher in college would hate me saying that, but. Yeah, they're permanent. They're permanently stored, but not the actual structure of the, just the, the, the definition is stored, of the view is stored, not the actual contents of the view. We just had a more translation moment. <laughs> yes. <coughs> no, it's not like an index at all. <coughs> no, it's not similar in function. An index is to make things go faster. A view is to abstract. It's to uh, step away from the physical structure and make it simpler to understand. Or for taking a really complex query and you don't want to keep typing it in every time, you can treat a view like a bookmark. You figured out this really cool query and you don't want to have to retype it every single time so you can create a view and store that cool query in the database for future use. And it behaves just like a table. So it would in, in Postgres, for example, if you use the object navigator, you'll see a, a, a leaf called views. If you happen to know what the view is called, you could go select star from whatever the view is called. It behaves just like a table. It depends what database server you're using. I'm not sure, I don't, my, my Microsoft SQL server stores them in a slightly different spot in the tree view, but it's still there. Uh, MySQL has a section called views. It's each, and it depends on the, what tools you're using, but they look just like a table. So, you know, if you can view the list of tables, you'll find the list of views. No, there is none, none whatsoever. Uh, normally they're not used on a developer level, um, often I've seen people prefix them with a V, so they know it's a view. It's your choice. I I am not enforcing any naming conventions on views. So, for example, earlier, there in the previous slide, this one here. Select buyer, seller, product, store from persons, and there's the join, right? 
And he created a view called Seattle View. And then if I were to do this, which is at this point I'm doing an old style join on it, then I'm joining that Seattle View to products. Here's what happens. It's doing the join here. It actually converts into a full-size join on the fly. So when you do this, it'll take the view, pull out the SQL out of it, and then add in the bits and pieces it needs, and then applies it to the database. It's actually really clever what it does and pretty complex. As far as you're concerned, a view is a bookmark to a query. That's the simplest explanation for it. Um, which leads me to the last two things. There's two types of views. Virtual views, it's what I've been talking about so far. These are views that aren't stored, just the definition. It's used right in the database. It's computed at the f on the band. It's sometimes slightly slower than a regular query. Not usually, but it's possible. And, but it's always up to date. It's live. Then there's something called materialized views. A materialized views is this. When you denormalize your database and you create all these extra tables, a denormalized view is basically, I mean, a, a materialized view is a view that's been, you take the results of it and you insert it into another table. It's a snapshot. Uh, that's a good way to, to put it. So often what happens is nightly, these tables get updated. Sometimes they get truncated and repopulated. Sometimes they just get appended to. Um, they're used for what's called data warehousing. In other words, huge data gets summarized and it gets placed into these tables for easy reporting. It's done offline. So by offline, I don't mean as in the computer's unplugged. It means it's not done real time. It's not done as a user hits a button. 1 a.m., a batch job starts and it starts populating the materialized views. There are, these have some issues. They can have stale data. For example, this materialized view was updated last night. Today we deleted 10,000 rows of data because we realized there was a mistake. Until tomorrow, the materialized view is now out of date because it's stale. It's not, it's not up to date. It's as if you wrote down your ideas on a piece of paper, but you can only change it once a day or whenever you chose to change it. So a materialized view is a view. It's, a t it's just a regular table, but it's a regular table that's basically summarized. So those are different kinds of views. And I'm actually going to skip this last little bit. Why? Because it's not that important. I want to get to the, yes, the summary for the assignment. Because I'm trying to get everybody out of here at a decent pace. Yeah. No, it's next week. Okay. Assignment two. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay. You should all be able to see it now. If you can't see it, let me know. If something's gone horribly wrong. It's under assignments. Good news. You don't have to find a partner. Good news, part number two. You don't have to deal with a partner. Good news number three, you don't have to tell me your partner didn't do anything. <laughs> That's the good news. Well, the bad news is it's a bit more work than the first assignment. However, it covers everything you've learned as of last week. So basically, you can think of this almost as a summary assignment. It, should, it covers everything you've learned. So I'm going to skip the fictional situation because I'll just explain roughly what it is, and you can read the fictional situation for your own enjoyment. I give you some sample data. This looks sort of familiar. Well, not familiar data, but you know, it looks like some stuff you've seen so far. Claude, you could also turn on your laptop and actually look at it on your screen instead of squinting at the TV. At the, at the I'm making it as big as I can and not actually go off the screen. That's about as big as it'll go. Okay. There are... Various columns, repeating data groups, that kind of stuff. What you are to do 
is you're going to take this data. You're going to normalize it. That's lab five. You are then going to diagram it, labs two, three, and four, right? So you're going to diagram it. You're going to normalize it. You are then going to hand type in the create table commands. I do not, I can tell if you use an auto generation tool. If you think I can't, you're, you're actually really, really good at faking it or you've gotten really good at sanitizing the output from a tool. So far, I've rarely had a student slip one of those past me. You are going to hand create the tables. Lab six. You are going to fill it with a little bit of sample data. Lab seven. Is this starting to see a pattern here? And then you're going to create four queries based on your design. That means that even though some of you may help each other out, your design should still be somewhat, there won't be that much variation. I mean, it's an asset database. There's only so many ways to write one of those. But the naming conventions may be different from one person to the other. Your choice of things you add in that is not necessarily listed there may be different from someone else. You are going to create four queries, only four. And I give you the list of what the queries are based on those queries that should also give you some hints on some of the data you may be missing that's not included in the data set. So you should read the whole thing and look at the queries at the bottom to give you hints of what you might be missing. This is also the same thing as labs eight and nine. So eight, mostly eight, and a little bit of nine. So essentially this assignment covers everything you've learned, except for today. You will supply a few things. Two files. The first one's a PNG. It's your diagram from PG Modeler. The second one is a single SQL file. If those of you haven't figured it out yet, an SQL file is a text file that has a .SQL extension. In it will be, it's from DB Modeler, a PG Modeler. You can do your diagram, you can export it as a PNG. And the second file is an SQL file that contains all the commands. In this file will be the commands to create your database, insert your data, and run the four queries. I have a script that I point at the directory and it runs. And it captures the output of what you did. Essentially, you, by the time what you handed to me, you should be able to just take it, create a virgin database, paste it in your SQL window and hit run. There should be no errors. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, in theory, you should be able to run each of those individually and they all work. Oh, yeah. well, my script actually captures the output based on each command. It's, it reads it block by block and executes it chunk by chunk. Basically, it takes the file, breaks it, and ex explodes it on semicolons, and then runs each command individually, capturing the output. If I get any error messages, I start deducting points. Oh, really? Uh, the math is really easy on this one. And there's actually a lot of points and lots of places to lose points. The design. 10 points for completeness of design. Did you cover everything? I'll be a little more draconian than I was with assignment one. You should roughly understand what a database is by now. The concept, at least. Five points for naming conventions. The 17 of you who lost points the first time. Please, let's not have that many again. Same naming convention, same rules of engagement. Yes, 17 groups, not 17 people. 17 groups out of 50 lost points on naming conventions. What an easy way to get points and you lost them. I was feeling a little sad. Five points for proper relations, as in, is everything properly designed relating to each other, as it should be? 
Do you notice it's not like a Simon 1 where I actually had a breakdown for, you know, design quality. Table creation scripts, eight points. I don't know exactly how many tables you're going to have in your design. But essentially the way it's going to go is it runs for every error I have to fix, I'm taking a point off. It's fair. I run it, there's a mistake, I have fix it, minus one. Oh, I got another mistake, minus one. Another mistake, minus one. Every, bu every bug is minus one. You're slowing things down for me and for everybody else. If it's, a, if it's just a case of a weird issue, like, oh, it came from a Mac and the Mac mangled the file, the file, you know, I might be able to run a script to fix it and that's not wasting my time. I'm just being facetious when I say wasting my time. But for every mistake, that means I have to, that, that means I have to go figure out what you did wrong, fix it so I can continue with the next step. Therefore, you should submit something that runs no errors. Yes? Yes. If we're working with an empty database, it should be the same for me as it is for you. Well, I'm gonna, I literally go drop schema public cascade, semicolon create schema public, semicolon, and then I run your file. Like I literally, every time I run it, it's as if it's being run on an empty database that's never been touched before. If it works on yours, it'll work on mine. It's like saying, yeah, it's literally like it's an empty room and you put in, you know, there's an empty room and you put a desk in this empty room. If you take that desk and you put it in my empty room, the desk is still going to work. <laughs> right? An empty room is an empty room. A virgin environment is a virgin environment. And that's what I'm testing on is virgin environment. Twelve test data. 12 points broken down into two points for each data item that at least includes the following things. Now, this is up to interpretation, some of this. Asset history depends on how you want to interpret it. This could be, when you look at the data at the top, there's a few different data items that could be considered history. Essentially, the odds are there's going to be five to six tables in this. I'm giving you two points per table. In other words, I have to be able to populate the database. If you give me table creation scripts and you give me no data, <laughs> that's an easy minus 12. Essentially, you're going to give me insert statements and they're going to work. And they're going to put something in pretty much every table. It's fairly straightforward. There are tricks on how to get this to do it and do it easy. And I can help those that want to learn those dirty tricks later. Not today. But I can them I can, might be able to do a little demo at the start of the next class. Queries. Remember I asked for four queries? Two points per. Query number one, does it work? Point number one, I mean. Point number one, does it work? Point number two, does it actually do what I asked you to do? If the query runs, congratulations, you got a point. If the query actually asks, does what I asked it to do, you get point number two. It's fairly straightforward. And then, as usual, two points at the end. What for? Did you name the file correctly? Three groups lost points for not naming their files right. I looked this up before I came to class today, so I have my numbers were right. I actually have them in a document. I made a point to not remember who it is that screwed up. But three groups lost points for not naming their files right. Like, really? That was easy points. The best part is he got one right, but the other one wrong. So two points, one per file. Now, you will have two weeks to do this, as usual. It's really not as big as you think it is. It really isn't. You're allowed to help each other within reason. If I get six copies and they all look identical, that's called plagiarism. <laughs> as in if your inserted data is the same as the person sitting next to you, that's copying. If your structure is very, very similar but your data is different and your queries are written a little different, that's not plagiarism. Right? 
It's like I say, write an article. It must have five paragraphs. The first paragraph is an introduction. The fifth paragraph is a conclusion. The three paragraphs in the middle contain these three topics. That's the structure. What you put inside of it should be different. If it looks the same as everybody else says, that's too bad. And I will, and I, I've gotten pretty good at picking out when things look exactly the same. And that's when you go have a visit with the coordinator, which right now would be Howard. In the winter terms, it'd be either Todd or uh, Carolyn. And if you end up having to be referred to these people, you're not going to have a good day. Because I think you know what the, the, the implications are for plagiarism, right? Ex no, it's suspension. Ex suspension, one year it's a one-year punishment. You go away for a year. I will be open-minded within a reason, but if yours is identical to the, the other guy, and it's identical to the other person, and there's five of you, they all look the same, it's going to be a group visit to the office. Okay? Because I can't prove who did it first. Right? So you're allowed to help each other within reason. Don't copy each other. I'll know. Within reason. Well, you're going to insert your own sample data. You've got to create the insert statements. Well, within reason, yeah. I mean, you're welcome to include what's there, but you may need to add some of your own. Or your inserts may not look the same as Amanda's because your structure is different. Okay? All right. One more announcement. One more announcement. One more announcement. I know we're all excited to get started. Next week, as always, is a work week. As I hand out these big assignments, I also make sure the following week has no lecture. I'll be here. There's no assigned lab. That doesn't mean lab eight's not due. It's just there's not a new lab being assigned. Technically, lab eight is this week's lab. So lab eight is still due at the end of next week, but next week's lab period is to work on the assignment. Next week's lecture period is to work on the assignment. There is, and then the other people say, well, when's the test? No. <laughs> the test is after the assignment. Once the assignment is done, I will issue the final test. And at the same time, I'll be issuing the other information about the finals and whatnot. So I'm not going to talk about the finals for two weeks, just so you know. So that's that. And you all get to run away now. <laughs>